previously on Dallas. I'm gonna have a baby. You're gonna have a baby? I don't see how you can be six weeks pregnant. Are you trying to tell me that you may not be the father of my child? I've been just as faithful to our marriage vows as you have, darling. Tell her there is something that means more to you than she does. The effects of large amounts of alcohol on the fetus are not completely known yet. But there's nothing wrong with me. The second season draws to a close with the dangling questions of what is going to happen to Sue Ellen and her baby, and if the rest of the family is going to find out about the paternity question. JR and Sue Ellen's Samuel Stern lookalike doctor discuss her prognosis. She's been hitting the bottle pretty hard. And she's also very resentful about being here. Her doctor says she'll likely relapse if she goes home, but JR demands to see her because his mommy and daddy are real concerned about her. That's heartwarming. Sue Ellen screams that she's being caged up against her will and throws a glass at JR, who seems genuinely shocked that she's so angry. Back at the ranch, Miss Ellie complains about Lucy's driving. Apparently, Lucy has gotten much more comfortable with higher speeds because Ray joked earlier in the season that Lucy drove like a little old lady on the highway. Jock and Lucy rush off to talk about her prom dress, which is the conversation that I really want to follow. What do you think, Grandpa? Sweet ones. I don't know what you kids are thinking these days. Oh, Grandpa. Instead, we stay with Bobby and Miss Ellie, who lament Sue Ellen's fall from grace. JR is not an easy person to live with, you know that. I always thought she was strong enough for him. Notice how easily the Ewings settle into the default of blaming their own toxic behaviors on others' weakness, like some faux Marilyn Monroe quote. Cliff tracks down Pamela at the store, and they have an argument about how much responsibility Cliff carries for Sue Ellen's condition. Pamela sticks up for Sue Ellen, telling Cliff to do the right thing by her or stay the hell away. This is the third standing ovation worthy dress down of a selfish character in this two-parter. JR and Sue Ellen are both in denial. JR says he's been too busy to check on her, and Sue Ellen tells Miss Ellie that everything is wonderful in the sanitarium. She's also in denial about her drinking habit, laying off her fainting spell on exhaustion. Miss Ellie practically begs Sue Ellen to leave JR, though not exactly in those words. When Ellie leaves, the nurse comes in and offers to get Sue Ellen the booze that she wants in exchange for some good old-fashioned bribery. Meanwhile, Lucy has passed her government class and is free to graduate. Muriel asks if she's going to invite Cindy to the celebration, and Lucy begrudgingly says yes. Wait, what did Cindy do? Wait, who is Cindy? You know, this show is begging for a Square Pegs-like spinoff. Lucy runs into her drug friends and tells them no, just like Nancy Reagan said to. Peter Horton gets all huffy and says that he's doubling the price the next time she wants to get high. Next time some guy dumps you and you come scrapping around here looking for something to make you feel better, it's going to cost you double. In therapy, Sue Ellen admits that she feels angry and neglected when JR works. She gets angry and defensive when her therapist brings up her drinking, though, so he asks her to reschedule for when she's feeling more like talking. Lucy admits that she lacks the confidence in herself sometimes and wonders why Sue Ellen is so flaky. Miss Ellie delivers Lucy's character thesis for the audience. Well, Lucy's very perceptive. Sometimes she can see right through that veneer that we older people like to hide behind. Ellie makes a good point about her privilege, telling Jock she could handle all the Ewing nonsense because being a Southworth came with some luxuries. Luxuries Pamela and Sue Ellen don't have. She also lets Jock know which side his bread is buttered on. Jock. I always felt secure in your love, except maybe once or twice. Apparently, the earlier talking to didn't set in with JR, so Jock sits him down to grill him on why Sue Ellen is cracking up. JR tries to change the subject to the OLM, but Jock isn't having it. Now, let me tell you how I plan on handling the OLM. The hell with the OLM. And now JR openly states his character thesis. Danny, I've always tried to please you, and always tried to be the man you wanted me to become. What else do you want from me? Jock tells him to be a good father and a good husband. JR, who seems incapable of humanity at this point, takes that to mean he should criticize and humiliate Sue Ellen into not drinking anymore. He shows Sue Ellen a newspaper article on Cliff Barnes and his new girlfriend. Sue Ellen accuses him of faking the article and then tosses him out. That article is enough to drive Sue Ellen to drink, so she gives in to the shady nurse. The nurse gets Sue Ellen soused right before Bobby arrives to visit. Bobby also gets the what for when he mentions the drinking, but he's Bobby, so he's just worried about her. 
Back in her room, Sue Ellen tells Bobby that she's miserable because JR has been running around and neglecting her. She also throws herself at Bobby, sort of, by saying she would have married him if they met first. She also lets him know that Cliff is the father of her baby. In a moment we can file under the unfairness of low expectations, Bobby is shocked, shocked I say, to find out that Sue Ellen has been having an affair on the very man who had been cheating on her. Bobby storms over to Cliff's to knock him around for using Sue Ellen. He threatens to finish the job before it ever gets back to Jock and Miss Ellie. <sighs> I'm gonna allow it. So you can Back at the sanitarium, Sue Ellen plots her breakout, but the nurse's goodwill only goes so far. So Sue Ellen blackjacks her with a Mr. Coffee carafe and sneaks out. The scene is deadly serious, of course, but Sue Ellen stopping to go back for the mouthwash liquor bottle is unintentionally hilarious. Sue Ellen steals a car and drives away from the sanitarium, only to wind up crashing the car while avoiding, get this, a wood paneled station wagon. How's that for a metaphor? Sue Ellen is only half conscious when she's brought into the hospital, but the doctor tells her that they have to deliver the baby now or they'll both die. Even with the delivery, it's gonna be touch and go. Cliff sees Sue Ellen's accident on the local news and races to the hospital. Pamela intercepts him before he can make a scene and then takes him to see the baby. In a heart-rending performance from Ken Kerchival, Cliff tearfully swears the baby will be raised to Barnes if he survives. Well, I know he's mine. And if he lives, he's gonna be raised to Barnes, not a Ewing. I swear to that. In a more understated but equally gut-punching emotional scene, JR and Bobby visit an unconscious Sue Ellen as she clings to life. JR finally reveals a bit of humanity. Oh, she's so pretty. Even now, Bobby, she's just beautiful. I don't know where it all went wrong. <laughs> and with Sue Ellen clinging to life, the second season ends on a cliffhanger. No pun intended. Well, this was an emotional roller coaster. The obvious first step in talking about the season is to discuss the ascension of Sue Ellen Ewing as a major character. In the first season, she was relegated to icy barbs thrown toward Pamela and Lucy, an unfortunate hammy pleading for JR's attention. Jail, we don't make love anymore. But somewhere around Black Market Baby, Sue Ellen became her own character. Whereas earlier episodes framed her marriage insecurities as an annoyance for JR, Black Market Baby turned them into a story arc for Sue Ellen. And with that, the second season found its theme, identity. Swellen is what happens when the person has no space to form their own identity, something the Dallas writers do an expert job of shading in through several different stories. We learn in For Love or Money that Swellen's mother raised her to fulfill men's desires so that she could land a wealthy husband. And much like every cautionary tale about getting what you wish for, Swellen winds up rich but stuck in a loveless, sexless marriage with a man who won't let her go. Now, if I have to, I'll have a couple of the boys take you down to a hospital I know. Everybody will just call it one of those unfortunate miscarriages. And you'll come out of that without one penny and no Ewing name. Um, you can't fight City Hall. One thing the Dallas writers do really well is using smaller stories and one-offs to accent their season arcs. In the second season, Sue Ellen's mother is unapologetic for preparing her to be a lovelorn trophy wife, but through Valerie Ewing, Jenna Wade, Ed Haynes, Garnet McGee, Guzzler Bennett, Leanne Rees, and a trio of hapless kidnappers, we see how susceptible people can be to grinding poverty. We may not agree with Patricia Shepard and what she did to Sue Ellen, but because the writers have been priming the audience with that lack of money is the root of all evil motif the entire season, we understand her in a more nuanced way. It's that kind of nuance that makes it hard for any of the main characters to be a flat villain. Sue Ellen wants desperately to fill her role as the trophy wife, so she's guilty of occasional toxic behavior toward Pamela and Lucy. JR wants desperately to receive his father's love, but he's been so love-starved since childhood that he's actually averse to any kinds of displays of affection that aren't the result of coercion. And all that culminates here, with JR incapable of anything resembling healthy love, so he substitutes power and control for nurturing compassion. It's the only love that he knows. It's not that he ignores the pleas from his parents to do right by Sue Ellen. It's that this is what he thinks love is. That's why Cliff and JR are two sides of the same coin. Cliff rejects Sue Ellen in favor of the power to destroy the Ewings. 
Even in Cliff's most vulnerable moment in this episode, he's still concerned with how the baby represents his legacy. Well, I know he's mine. And if he lives, he's going to be raised at Barnes. Ultimately, it's Min's inability to love that drives Sue Ellen to destruction. Which is why the other women at South Fork have such a hard time understanding her. And one of the great ironic twists of the show, though, JR's feelings for Sue Ellen were always bubbling under the surface. He did, after all, give Cliff the power to destroy Ewing Oil in exchange for leaving Sue Ellen alone. In his own perverse, control freak way, JR was showing how much he loved Sue Ellen. And that's the second season of Dallas in a nutshell. A group of people defined by a collection of toxic love styles, identity needs, and the inability to love. In the third season, that will only grow more pronounced. But for now, let's let the second season set, like a fine bourbon and branch. Harvey, let's get some f***ing branch toast. <laughs> Came out of nowhere. <laughs>